Hello, my name is Evans Mensa, and you can relive all the fun and excitement on Top Story, News Night, and of course, Ghana Connect via podcast. All you need to do is to log on to my Joy Online slash podcast. Set for your favorite show and relive the moment. Joy 99.7 FM, your radio for designing listeners. All right, we're on to the AM show, and thank you, Rick Wampo, for bringing us the sports. Now we're going on to another conversation we have to do uh, with COVID-19. There are those who still don't believe it is real because they say they don't know anyone who's had COVID-19. Well, legendary music producer uh, Ham has been talking about his experience and how he had to shed tears because he thought he was going to die. Before we bring you his story, I just want to go to my Facebook page and constantly when I post uh, the COVID-19 updates on my Facebook page, you get people coming in and uh, they're, they're doubting it and they see all sorts of things. So you see um, Mohammed Gazeli's comment there it says, for almost two years, how many has malaria killed within the same period of tuberculosis or even maternal deaths? So essentially he's, he's well, they, people tend Same to downplay. Numbers, yeah, they yeah. downplay it a lot. And then uh, Moses comes in and says, uh, they are all fake. When someone dies at the hospital, they say, we'll say it's COVID-19, but won't quarantine the person uh, sitting by his side during the illness. So you get a lot of these people who, who come on and uh, when I post uh, about COVID-19 anymore, and they, they, they say all sorts of things. Yeah, they do. For many of them, they say they don't believe it. I think that we, we've been lucky here in Ghana. Our death rate has been very low, um, and, and that has been a blessing. Yeah. And sometimes this blessing is almost a curse, because what it does is that, you know, it gives the illusion that it's okay, and it's not as bad, and it's not, you know, all of that. But if you remember countries like China, who were, you know, having to disinfect their roads, you know, from the sheer magnitude of people who had COVID-19 and were dying. You remember Italy? In Italy. What happened in Italy um, last year, even the US, you know, the UK, and, you know, some of these other numbers, you realize that, look, we're not joking. Look, we're, we've just been lucky yeah. that we're not dying. Not that we're not getting it, but that we're not dying from it. And for whatever the reasons are, you know. And then there's also a lot of asymptomatic people. We've been lucky. And sometimes that luck is kind of like a little curse, isn't it? Because you have people say things like this. Um, but it is what it is. And, yeah. and when you speak to somebody who has lost someone, then you know the reality of, of, of what it is. So every now and then you get people who, a lot of people don't like to talk about their COVID experience mm. because they, there's this stigma. And I don't get the stigma though, because I mean, they, virtually there's so many people who have had COVID. Yeah. Donald Trump had COVID. Yeah. So it's, I don't understand why people would stigmatize people who have had COVID. I have had COVID. Yeah. I didn't have a really severe one, but yes, I had COVID. And life goes back to normal if, if you don't die. So once in a while, when we have people who have had COVID and come to share the experience, we want to share that experience with you so that those who say that I don't know anybody who has uh, COVID, has had COVID, they probably will learn something from yeah. it. And that's why we're bringing you the story of uh, legendary music producer, Hammer. He has produced a number of the hate life artists we have uh, in the country, and you've enjoyed his songs over time yeah. and all that. So he had this encounter, and it was after he survived, he took to his Facebook page and uh, actually posted this video on YouTube, which we're sharing with you. So you watch his story and get others to watch, those who doubt that COVID is real. Hopefully, Maybe you may change their minds and get them to mask up. Let's watch Hammer's story. That began my ordeal. Right, so that's a music producer, Hammer. There's a whole lot more to that story or what he had to share. It, it goes on for about 33 minutes. We can bring you all, but I want you to bring, bring you this part where he actually thought he was going to die, and so he was crying 
because he... Well, that's uh, Hamada. We'll be speaking with Professor uh, Alfred Yossing, who's head of community health at the University of Ghana Medical School in a bit. But we've also uh, posted on Facebook and we're getting... We want you, if you've been a survivor, to share with us your story. So we have that post. Uh, we'll get to see what comments are coming and we can get to share uh, some of the comments that you've posted. But, you know, anymore, there the are those who, I posted this video, and the, the, some who came to it and were asking who takes a video of himself um, when he's at the point of death. Mm -hmm. And Hama just explained it, that yes, he thought he was going to die, but he felt he should do something and leave something behind so that people who don't believe yeah that there's COVID, once he's dead, you can share these videos and uh, you get to know that, well, they say if someone, if the crocodile comes from the river and tells you that. So please, let's not downplay what this, the story mm -hmm. that Hama is sharing. There are others too who say that he's acting. I don't know when Hama became a, an actor. An actor, but Israel, the thing is you even see his reactions and the way that he is at, the, at, at, at this point, you see it across a lot of the videos that we've seen of people who yes. felt like they were at their last, you know, where they can't breathe and where it's... I remember speaking to Raymond Aqua, you know, one of our colleagues who also yes, had COVID, also. and he, his, his, uh, his own was, was terrible. And he said that at some point he even prayed that he would die because the pain was so much, you know, and I've had friends who've had it who've done videos, and, and, and like you said, it's really just at that very last point where you feel like it's because the, like it's quarantined and it's closed and all of that, so we don't get to actually see what the end looks like and what the pain looks like, and we need more of these stories for those who just don't believe that it's there. Indeed, and uh, so on Facebook, we've, uh, we're asking you that it's been a year since uh, Ghana recorded its first uh, COVID-19, more than a year actually, since Ghana recorded this first uh, COVID-19 case, uh, we have you survived? How have you survived the scourge of the virus? So you can share your story with us. We have uh, three comments coming in so far, and uh, Abdul says, "I thank Allah for still keeping us uh, life and the entire family in prayer. May Allah continue to protect us all and heal His Allah for us." And um, Ajay says, "On behalf of my." Family, I send my sincere gratitude to God Almighty for bringing us this far. After one of us was tested positive for COVID-19 without being quarantined, God healed him miraculously without, without anybody, anybody being, being infected, infected in the same house. Oh. And, and that's the thing with COVID. So the, you never know how it's going to strike you. So some may get the COVID and they may never show symptoms. In fact, majority of people don't show any symptoms. But somebody may also get it and they end up in a really, really, really terrible, terrible situation. Or dead. Yeah, or dead. Yeah. They could die. So we could just look at the latest task that we have right now. And uh, it's, it's on the National COVID-19 um, dashboard. We are looking at 1,008 deaths so far. Mm. 1,008 people have died so far. We've had uh, confirmed cases of 117,636. And then the recoveries, discharges, we're looking at 109,612, which is the point I'm making. 117,000 people got it, 109,000 109, recovered. All right? Right now, the active cases have gone beyond 7,000. So 7,016. 596 yeah. new cases. Let's, let's get on to Zoom and uh, speak with Professor Alfred Yossin, who's head of community health at the University of Ghana Medical School. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yossin. So you heard uh, Hammer's story, the music producer, and I'm sure you also encounter people who say that they don't believe that COVID is real. What, to, what do you say to people like that? Yes, thank you very much, Israel and Inua. It's, it's been a good education, I've watched it, and it's very touching. And that's the reality of the issue. There are many more people like that who probably didn't make a video as Hama has done for such public education. It is true and still very disturbing and worrying when despite all the numbers you've just mentioned, 
if over a thousand people have died, over a hundred thousand have gotten infected, and we still believe this is a fluke, there is no disease like that, somebody is making it up, it's, it's quite difficult. But we as physicians, as public health practitioners are not very surprised because uh, dealing with public in terms of health education and health promotion activities is always challenging. And until people get to experience it or a close relation, a family member or a friend gets to experience it, these things may continue to occur. And what we need to do as you are doing is to continue to engage the public, get people to tell their stories, what they've been through, Every day at the treatment center, we get to have terrible experiences. And then these family members who have gone through it, really, there is nobody to just convince them that this does not exist. It really does. And people are going through. Not only that, Israel, we are saying a lot more people are getting it and are recovering. And that's very good. However, we also know that COVID have what we call long-term effects, and we are beginning to have what we call long COVID. People get it, they may not even have a lot of symptoms initially, but after four weeks, after eight weeks, they begin to have these residual symptoms, which may persist and then affect their social functioning, affect their psychological well-being, and also even their ability to work. So it is best not to get infected in the first place. So every measure that we need to take to prevent ourselves from getting infected is the best we could do for ourselves and for our families and friends. If we continue to deny that the condition is not or does not exist, or it is only in Accra, or it's among the middle class, but for those uh, everyday easygoing people, it, it's not true. We have all uh, manner of persons and the profile of patients cut across every level of society, and therefore nobody is immune from the condition. So we need to continue to educate the public like what you are doing. It's a very important step just to let people know that really people have had near-death experiences and it is not something that we can take for granted. Now, Professor, you're saying that you, you agree that uh, it's good to have pe more people come out to, to speak when they, when they get COVID. But there are other instances where we have some public figures who may have had COVID and they don't want to make it public. Or they also say that doctor, patient confidentiality, uh, a patient's hospital records, medical records are supposed to be private. But in situations where we have pandemics, where we know that if we have people, or if we talk about people who have had COVID, I mean, I, I know so many people who have had COVID, you know, um, people in public, high in, in public office who've had COVID, but I can't, as a media man or as a journalist, I can't talk about it. Do we get to a point where we allow such conversations so that it, because it's for the public good, is, is that something you think we should consider? Yes, it's always a thin line between doing the right thing and also invading people's privacy, as you said. So it is always the encouragement to the individual. Doctor-patient confidentiality is important. But when we get to know that by not disclosing, you are also putting other lives at risk, then we need to strike the balance. In this case, everything is themed deeply in our culture, where in other areas, people will readily come out, be it a president, be it a prime minister, they want to come out and tell the world that I have got this, this is what I've gone through and have recovered. In our situation, things are different. It's People feel it may be used against you, and especially when stigma is so high, uh, politicians will not be willing to share their experiences, CEOs, big people in society, and this is where the challenge is. So we, we by legislation, it's difficult, but we still need to encourage people as a matter of public good and for public education 
that you come out and be able to tell people your story. Much as we are wary about individual confidentiality, doctor-patient information, disclosure, and all that, it is something that will be good for the public. And when we have figures coming out, chiefs, prominent members, uh, reverend ministers, politicians, doctors, nurses, people who have gone through this, media personnel, then it really helps the fight. So as you rightly said, there is a delicate balance, and we need to continue to encourage people to do this from their free will. And that is where the challenge is. Because if you try to legislate or force people, then the privacy issues and confidentiality it's important. But in situations like a pandemic, where we need information to help others, it is our civil responsibility in this case, I would say, in terms of public health, to protect others. And therefore, if we know that if we come out and educate the people or tell our story, as we have just seen, is going to go a long way in helping the fight against COVID. I believe it is our social responsibility, our civil responsibility, to do that, not for ourselves, not only for our close family, but for the entire communities and the population as well. So we will continue to encourage people and also try to deal with the stigma and then the denial that the disease does not exist in the first place. Once we did that, many people would be willing to share their story. So I think it's too uh, false All right. in this case. So we need to look at now. Let's that. let's talk about the stigma bit. And one of the reasons people wouldn't want to come out to indicate that they have uh, had COVID is because of the stigma. The stigma is quite high. But I'd want you to use the opportunity to educate people why they shouldn't stigmatize people who have COVID. Because, um, I mean, from what I know, you get the virus, it stays with you for a, a while, and then it leaves you. After it leaves you, you're fine. You can't infect any other person. Can you please um, enlighten us on that? Yes. It is important for all of us to understand that COVID is basically a type of flu illness. And it gets into the body and depending on the individual's constitution and then their response. Most people may not have any symptoms at all. Others may have severe symptoms and others may even die from it. Whatever be the case, the virus will run its course in the person. And as we've gotten to know, by 14 days maximum, there are a few cases, even when people test positive, their risk of transmitting the disease to other persons is so reduced and minimal. So especially when people have gotten the disease and have recovered, there should be no fear of interacting with such persons. And we continue to encourage members of the public, continue to wear your mask, continue to wash your hands. If we did that, there is nothing to worry about when you interact. If the woman is a shop owner and she has gotten COVID and has recovered, there is nothing to worry about going to buy things from the shop. If the person is a teacher, there is nothing to be worried about that I won't let my child go to the school because a teacher has tested positive and the teacher has recovered. So we are educating the public and communicating that it is important. If we all did that, we support each other and encourage people after they've been through the difficulties and the stress of the condition, that we welcome them and encourage them, interact with them. That will help boost confidence, and also will encourage them to come out freely and tell their story. So the stigma issue was worse in the initial stages. Uh, it is relatively better. It still continues to persist. What challenge we have now is the denial. So once you combine the denial and the stigma, some of these uh, non-disclosures are bound to happen. So yeah. we, we will continue to educate and encourage the public oh. to get over some of these misconceptions about the disease. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Alfred Yossin, for making time to speak with us. Uh, Professor Alfred Yossin is the head of community health 
at the University of Ghana Medical School. There are other things that I would have loved for Prof to touch on, but uh, we do not have time. We have to move on to our next uh, issue. Yes, next segment. Next, next.